Okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm a moderator for this webinar. I'm also coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network, and the editor of the Marine Ecosystems and Management Newsletter. And um, I'm very pleased to have on my, my colleague, uh, Ray Evrard, who is going to help uh, co-moderate this webinar. And we are thrilled to have a very distinguished pan a group of a panelists and presenters here today. We have Jack Kittinger, who's the Senior Director of the Global Fisheries and Aquaculture Program in Conservation International Center for Oceans. And he's also a professor of practice um, at Arizona State University Center for Biodiversity Outcomes. We also have uh, Yoshi Oda, who's policy director for the NERIUS program and research assistant professor uh, of the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs at the University of Washington. We have Lydia Tay, who's a research associate uh, with, with the, um, at the University of British Columbia's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries and an honorary research associate for the NERIUS program. And we have Katrina Nakamura, who's the the founder of the Sustainability Incubator, which offers technical services for sustainable seafood worldwide. And we have Nathan Bennett, who's currently a postdoctoral fellow with the Ocean Canada Partnership and Env Environment and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia, and an affiliated researcher with the Center for Ocean Solutions at Stanford University. So I, um, today's webinar, I'm very excited about. I saw a science paper that these guys um, co-authored uh, that came out recently and knew we really wanted to hear um, from this group about their research because we really want to um, have our webinars bring in a lot of the human aspects of ecosystem-based management, um, more so than, than we have in the past. And also just as an individual consumer of seafood, this is a topic of, of great concern to me. And so I figured um, it would be for a lot of uh, our network as well. Um, and just to reiterate, this, this um, webinar is uh, brought to you by the OCTO, which um, is the parent organization for the EBM Tools Network, which is also uh, co-coordinated by uh, NatureSurf. Okay, so I wanted to give an outline of, of sort of how this webinar is going to go. Um, we're on a new Zoom platform, which we're getting used to, but we're very excited about. Uh, it's got a couple, a bit of functionality yeah. I'd let you know about. So there's opportunity for chats, which all of you are able to send chats, which everyone including other attendees can see um, so this is very powerful and uh, we'll let you can let some side discussions happen but uh, we ask that you be, use it professionally and only and keep things concentrated on the topic at hand um, you can also send in questions to be asked to the panelists through the question interface we encourage you to go ahead and send in questions throughout the webinar um, we're going to have presentation and then we'll have uh, hear from all the individual panelists and then um, and we'll have questions at the end so you can send in your questions at any point and we'll we'll address most of them during the Q&A at the end, although it's possible if there's just quick clarifying questions, we might tackle them during the webinar. Okay, uh, so with all that introduction, um, I will turn it over to you now, Jack. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you great. Great, all right, well thanks everybody. It's great to be here and I want to thank my fellow panelists. And um, well, let's kick it off here. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Oh. Doesn't want to advance for me. It's kind of awesome. <laughs> wonderful. Great. Okay, great. Um, so, look, most of us who work in the seafood world understand uh, that that seafood is the most traded food commodity on the planet. Uh, it's the last thing globally that we hunt. Though, of course, we are now raising and farming seafood at a rate that's been unprecedented. And over the past several decades, you know, most of the narrative, the public narrative, not the technical insider baseball narrative, but that uh, that is debated in the public sphere has focused primarily on issues of environmental uh, problems in the seafood sector and in oceans generally. But starting uh, a few years back, that narrative shifted and it did so because of uh, an incredible amount of journalism that went on that focused on issues of slavery and human rights abuses, primarily in Southeast Asia. And The Guardian first uh, broke these stories in 2014, focused on Thailand. Uh, those, uh, that reporting was followed by the Associated Press that won a Pulitzer for their work uh, on these issues and other major media outlets such as the New York Times and so on. 
And what this did collectively was raise the profile of social issues in the seafood sector. And it also uncovered that these social abuses uh, are among the worst of any sector on the planet, um, as bad as and maybe worse than mining, agriculture, um, other production sectors. And it, and it started a, a whole set of, uh, of dialogues in the sector among businesses, governments, nonprofits, and other actors uh, on how to deal with these issues. Uh, it's important to remember that the human face of this. Uh, these are enslaved workers from Myanmar, Cambodia, and, and Laos disembarking a ship in Indonesia. Uh, these workers were rescued as part of a, a, an incredible operation by an organization called the Labor Rights Promotion Network. Uh, and, and we often forget when we look at the, the journalism and you know, the academic articles and things as such, the, the human face of, of this. And we wanted to highlight that. Uh, and essentially what the challenge is is to ensure that these social abuses are eliminated ensuring that seafood is produced in a way that doesn't compromise the basic rights and freedoms of people around the planet. Now, these labor rights abuses and other social problems in the sector are being driven by uh, some trends globally. And one of those trends that are really critical when you think about the limits of the ocean is that people are increasing uh, in affluence, particularly in the developing world. So that rising middle class has transformed the seafood industry into a luxury food, um, you can see here in this graph that fish is the most consumed animal protein on the planet, more than beef, more than, more than poultry, um, more than pork. And that increasing affluence is driving this demand growth curve. It's also being driven by increases in population. So there is a kind of Malthusian issue here, but also an increasing human footprint, particularly in the developing world, as I mentioned. And here, if you look at this map, the areas with the red colors and warm colors, the oranges there, uh, those are areas where the demand growth for seafood is predicted to rise at a level that's three times that of the global north. Uh, most demand right now is in the global north. That's Europe, North America, um, and most of the production is in the global south, but we're seeing the rise in demand uh, primarily in uh, South America, Africa, and, and Asia particularly Southeast Asia. And that's, a, that's, a, that's gonna continue to drive both environmental problems and critically these social problems. Now, when our group started working on this, we started to look at what are the major issues in the sector, the major social issues. And the first of course is the set of issues uncovered by those pioneering journalists who um, were working on these issues. And it's, it's also worth noting that a number of other folks in academia and the research sector and private sector have also worked on those issues for years uh, prior to them becoming publicized uh, more widely in 2014, 2015. Um, but when we think about human rights abuses and slavery, there's obviously huge moral and ethical issues to these things. But it's also worth remembering that slavery exists because it's profitable. Uh, and if you think about this in cold, hard economic terms, uh, these rights abuses are a perverse subsidy to production. Um, and so that's part of the issue for why this exists in the sectors because of the lax oversight and lack of governance in some of these areas. Um, and, the, and of course, the economic uh, uh, subsidy that it provides to these production systems. And we think about slavery, we must remember that modern slavery, and this is a definition by Siddharth Kara, who's worked on, on these issues for more than a decade. Uh, modern slavery comprises a whole set of practices from the most egregious abuses such as slavery um, to less egregious but nonetheless very widespread practices such as bonded labor, abrogation of wages, and so on. And so when we think about this suite of things, we have to remember that not just to zero in on the things that are most egregious, but to think about the full suite of coercive activities related to labor and human rights. The second major bin of issues is discrimination and lack of equality. Half of the workforce in the sector is comprised of women. This is some 200 million people uh, that work in the sector worldwide. And, and uh, many of the groups that work in this sector are often overlooked and uh, are often vulnerable to issues of discrimination. Um, women, migrant workers, uh, folks of different socioeconomic status or religious or cultural affiliation and so on. Uh, so the equality issues in the sector are huge. And 
There are also issues of equity. That, and, and by equity, we mean the, the power dynamics that shape uh, who makes decisions and who profits or benefits from those decisions in the sector. And then last, while the seafood sector uh, and global demand curves are marked by increasing affluence, there are still a huge amount of people on the planet that rely on these systems for a basic means of nutritional and livelihood security. And that is something we cannot forget. It's a vital aspect um, and life support system for a wide array of millions of people on the planet. Uh, this is kind of a noisy map, but if you zero in on the ocean areas that are in dark blue, those are areas for which the marine fisheries production is expected to decline uh, by a significant amount. And those areas happen to co-occur with countries, um, and um, we're looking at the countries in orange or yellow, for whom there are significant populations that rely on fisheries for basic nutritional support. And what you can see is that a lot of these countries that are very vulnerable and very reliant on fisheries also co-occur with areas where the fisheries production is predicted to decrease due to climate change. Now that's a perfect storm of, of problems and, and vulnerability that has to be addressed and we cannot forget the reliance for nutritional and livelihood security that these systems provide. We started working on this, uh, myself, the other panelists who you'll hear from in a moment, uh, and a wide array of partners you can see grouped around this table at the Monterey Bay Aquarium last year. Um, we started this about two and a half, three years ago. And we zeroed in on a singular problem in the space. And that was that uh, with the wide array of actors, both private sector, nonprofit, governmental, and so on, we needed a common language. We needed a common way to define what we meant by social responsibility in the sector. And we zeroed in on that as a really necessary first step because without a common language and a common definition of what social responsibility was, we, we ran the risk of spinning off into a bunch of different directions and critically not aligning around collective action to improve social issues in the sector. And we spent two and a half years developing essentially an agreed upon framework and definition. And we're able to get that published in science last year. Um, in June, and uh, it was published uh, right to be timed right before the UN Oceans Conference and the Seafood Summit, both of which were in June. Uh, we had 34 authors from 21 different institutions on the paper. That was very deliberate. It's meant to represent a coalition of minds that came together to focus on this issue. People from academia, from the nonprofit world, consultants to the sector, social experts, environmental experts, and so on to represent a consensus agreed upon definition. And essentially that definition establishes a global standard for social responsibility. And here's what that standard looks like. The first uh, principle or component to the standard is to protect human rights, dignity, and access to resources. Um, that should become as no surprise to anyone. Most of the issues that have been publicized around social abuse in this sector center around human rights, slavery, and other similar conditions related. Uh, to human rights. But we also critically included a component about access to resources because there's a whole suite of social, cultural, and economic rights that surround people's uh, rights to resources that are also essentially bundles of rights that, that are often ignored in the dialogue when it comes to um, human rights. The second component is to ensure equality and equitable opportunity to benefit. Equality and equity are a little bit different. Equality means that you don't discriminate based on socioeconomic status, religious affiliation, culture, uh, migrant status, gender, uh, or, or any factor. Equity means that people involved in the production, processing, and the entire supply chain have equal opportunities to benefit from, from that system, uh, not just those with the most financial or political power. And then thirdly, Improving food and, lively, food and livelihood security, a critical concern in the sector, as I mentioned previously. And um, it's easy to imagine uh, a, a company being on the cover of the New York Times next year because they're sourcing seafood from a community that can no longer feed itself due to its fishery being over, over harvested. And so this is a critical concern as well. Now, having established this global standard with three components that we 
um, hoped would be easily understood by folks across a wider range of roles in the sector and beyond. Um, obviously, the next challenge is moving from principles to practice with the sector. And um, we think there's three critical solution areas that we've been focusing on for the last six months plus, um, you know, in the dialogues to develop the global standard. We obviously were talking about how to implement it. And, and here are kind of the three areas that we're working on implementation. Um, the first is implementing effective governance. To put it simply, uh, there are roles that governments have that no one else can fill, the roles of enforcement and policing, um, the, the effective management systems that allow communities, enterprises, and markets to function efficiently and to function in a, such a way that removes uh, egregious social practices and social abuses. And so the key here is to implement policy reforms that incentivize better practices and protect the critical um, and vulnerable populations in the system such that they uh, are, are, are not being um, harmed through, the, through existing practices. Now, the good news is there are a whole raft of international legal and policy instruments, and here is a table that we published with the paper. You're not meant to read all of this. It's obviously quite a lot, um, but there is great uh, international law and policy guidance uh, documents that uh, have been internationally uh, endorsed um, that provide a suite of governance um, tenants and frameworks that domestic legislation can follow and that countries can implement in their geographies. Uh, so we're not lacking for legal guidance and frameworks for how to implement these practices, though certainly we need to invest more energy in doing so. The other thing that's relevant is that we have a proliferation of new technologies, new systems, uh, that people are putting into place that allow us to understand the sector uh, with a greater degree of, of resolution and detail. This is just one example, Global Fishing Watch, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. So we're testing around whether or not systems like this can be used to estimate hot spots of um, human rights abuses. Uh, and there are social organizations who've been involved in this effort that are, are pioneering all kinds of efforts uh, to provide voice to workers, to provide accountability and transparency and so on. So we have a, a, a good uh, new suite of tools in the systems, technologies, and, and human capital that's being directed towards this. The second major solution is, is private sector leadership. And um, I can't stress this enough. The, the, the role of businesses, enterprises, and the seafood industry uh, in, in providing leadership on this issue is critical. And we have seen it since the outset. We are able to recruit uh, a number of uh, seafood businesses who endorsed the, this framework, uh, and they did so before the UN Oceans Conference. So you can go on the UN Oceans Conference website and see these endorsements that these businesses have made. Uh, these are the first adopters, the early adopters, and, and you know there are some very large and very visible uh, businesses on this list. Um, and the good news is that you know they're these folks are pioneering the road. They're, they're part of the solution and, and, and they wanna reduce this as a business risk and they wanna do this uh, for moral and ethical reasons. And, um, and that's gonna result in better social performance as they embed this in their, their sourcing policy and their tracking um, and their transparency initiatives and so on. So there's a, a lot of, of more work to do to get the, uh, the sector more broadly to endorse and buy in, in on this. And we're seeing great signs of private sector leadership. And then lastly, we cannot undervalue the role of building capacity. Now, building capacity can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but put simply, we've got to work with the frontline groups, with um, uh, people involved in the sector to build their ability to uh, participate uh, in, in systems that respect their rights, give them voice, um, and uh, improve their, their livelihood. Uh, throughout the supply chain from the from the from hook to plate here so that is our that's the presentation uh, focused on the, the the framework the global standard that we've developed um, the solution areas that we think are critical and now we're going to turn to a set of wonderful panelists uh, who are <laughs> joining me and talking about this all of these folks have been involved in this initiative since the beginning uh, with me is Lydia Tay who is at the University of British Columbia works with the Nereus program uh, in the Institute for Oceans Ocean. and Fisheries at UBC. Uh, Yoshi Ota, who's a research professor at the School of Marine Environmental Affairs at UW in Seattle. Katrina Nakamura, who has worked 
um, on this issue for years and uh, runs a group called the Sustainability Incubator, and Nathan Bennett, who's also um, up in, uh, in Canada and has worked on these issues as well for quite a long time. So with that, I will turn it uh, to my panelists and I'm gonna ask, um, we're gonna go in this order and, and I'm gonna uh, ask uh, Lydia to chat a bit about the policy world and, and some of the legal instruments and how they're relevant to these issues. Katrina will talk about tools and measurement. Um, Nathan will talk about social science perspectives and Yoshi will talk about a range of issues, including indigenous and cultural perspectives on this. Uh, I think we'll start with Lydia. So Lydia, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Thanks, Jack. And thanks for that um, overview. Um, so um, I will be just briefly covering some of the um, guidances and policies that we looked at um, in the process of coming up with these, um, the, the the principles for socially responsible seafood um, that we came up with. And Jack had showed um, in one of his slides that there is a, a whole suite of um, policies and legal instruments that are both um, hard laws and soft laws. Um, the international and the, the regional, and some are also coming from um, private certification and rating bodies. So what we did um, was to look also at uh, the, the, the policies from these uh, various um, sources to see to what extent they address uh, the different types of rights that we are concerned with. So the, the different types of rights, um, um, as Jack had brought up, they range everything from um, slavery, like forced labor, child labor, and human trafficking, to the more um, subtle social, economic, and cultural rights. Um, so over there, we have things like equity and equality, whether there's access and whether there's um, recognition and participation given to stakeholders. So uh, we, uh, we went through um, the, the legal policies and um, guidances uh, to assess um, to what extent all these different types of rights were uh, um, addressed. And we, we found that um, the, the civil and political rights, which cover things like slavery and human trafficking, those groups of rights were pretty um, well defined and covered, but the social and economic and cultural rights were, were, less, um, were less concretely covered in um, uh, some of the policies. So they were not as well defined. And so when we're talking about what um, capacity there is to ensure benefits from um, seafood trade, for example, will flow to communities or to small-scale fisheries, we have to be more um, aware of um, and, and come up with, I, I guess we're talking about things like policies that are targeted correctly to the group that we're concerned with and what what types of capacities they have within themselves to be able to uh, benefit from things like sustainable seafood. Um, so that was one of the um, key things that came out from this part of um, our work. And um, I, I think from here, it, it just makes it clear that um, even though we do have a, a, a lot of um, policies uh, at, at our disposal, that um, when we are talking about socially responsible seafood, the, the issues that are less obvious, things like uh, ensuring um, access and addressing the equity and equality issues, those ones are still very much, um, they still require a lot of work and it's not necessarily something that um, people are aware of. And so that's where the, the focus should be um, if we want to uh, achieve uh, uh, the, the, the types of aspirations that, uh, that were covered in the principles that we put forward. So I think I will pass it back to Jack for now. 
Great. I think we're going to Yoshi next, right? And Yoshi, I think you're going to steal the screen from me, right? <laughs> Yoshi, you there? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I was misunderstanding all those. Sorry about that. I apologize. So I'm going to show you some slides uh, to talk about the few things I wanted to highlight. Um, can you guys actually see my slides or not? not uh, I think they're coming up now. And have you pressed share screen? Yep. Okay. Um, really yep. Yeah, yeah, they're coming up now. And if you put it in presentation mode. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Good. So it's okay. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Um, as I embark upon um, these issues, you know, I agree with all what Jack says. There's issues which we highlighted, and there are solutions. But um, among those issues and the solutions which we perceive and understood, I think it's very important for us to also understand some of the details and which becomes very important when solutions are implemented. And also as we actually create this narrative about uh, slavery and human rights abuse among fisheries, we really have to start thinking about, you know, where the equity issues, where the power lies, you know, what our um, understanding of currently fishing and where the fish comes from, you know, really have to be very critical about it. So the first things I wanted to say is this issue, this things what we are talking about, so it's responsible or irresponsible fisheries, it's not a wicked problem. It's not unsolvable. It's completely solvable. We know what's going on, you know, place to places, you know, we know who are the victims are and there are lots of um, NGOs working in various places. And this really is a problem we can tackle and solve it if we really wanted to. Um, but there are a few things we have to keep in my mind. And first, I wanted to point out um, just because there's no data, you know, there's simply there's a data gap, which doesn't actually mean socially responsible fisheries might actually occur. So one of the things which I wanted to mention is uh, my study on Indian uh, fisheries. I created this um, very patchy um, global indigenous fisheries database just to highlight, you know, how much of the seafood consumption goes to um, indigenous groups in the coast and uh, we somehow figure out and put the number together and then it's 2% of global reported catch. Number is not surprising and uh, many places um, Indian groups um, consume much higher than national average, which is not surprising. The point of what I wanted to make here is this wasn't visible before we did it. And, um, but we, we, so we identify those as a vulnerable people, but I mean, they're not really always vulnerable as such. You know, they manage with the change and they, uh, uh, um, they're working with the change in their economy and their social issues. And, 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 and the point is, you know, these, there are data gaps, but it doesn't actually mean these people engage with any sort of irresponsible fisheries. It's actually opposite. You know, second point I wanted to make is these phenomena are not phenomena as in these slavery fisheries and human rights abuse and, and, and any sorts of socially responsible fisheries are not always the result of either corporate greed, you know, or lack of management. Um, one of the, uh, the reason why I'm saying this is the fisheries is just a really highly uh, uh, complex uh, industry. And we have a uh, safety system, you know, sustaining, sustained by ecosystem to the fisheries and supply chain and consume going to um, implement um, socially responsible fisheries. There are challenges at each um, systems and then they are interwind and then they are uh, uh, much layers and, and, and then these are not really only governed by um, corporates and then there's mix of private and public partnership is everywhere. So we shouldn't really reduce it into one beneficiaries or one power structure. Um, it's much more regional and it's much more complex. And the third thing I wanted to make is the mechanism which kind of creates this issue of uh, social responsible fisheries, not always social ecological. I mean, it sounds maybe a little bit contradictory, but what I meant by this is global environmental change, such as climate change, cannot simply be a single cause to bring any of the fishery pushed into this uh, misconduct. As you can see in this map, the middle part, which is sort of like a red, is the part which uh, the local fisheries will get most impact 
from global environmental change, uh, global climate change, and, and, and biodiversity loss. But doesn't actually mean, you know, those are going to straight into engaged with slavery or any of the misconduct. Just because pie gets smaller, doesn't actually mean people who share the pie actually start fighting. They're much more very historical and uh, currently political um, issues which are embedded it um, to produce this socially responsible fisheries. So I just like to highlight, it's not a wicked problem we can solve it, but we shouldn't always depend on the data gaps. We shouldn't really think it's just a corporate issues and we shouldn't really think it's a simple mechanism coming from environmental change into social issues. Thank you. Wonderful. Jack, back to you. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can uh, be smart enough to do this. <laughs> First, again. Okay, great. All right. Back to the panelists. Uh, can you see my panelist slide now? We can, yes. <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. Katrina, you're up. Hi, everybody. Thank you for um, being part of this. It's wonderful to see the interest. I'd like to speak for a, um, just a moment about utilizing human rights data. Um, and where I'm coming from is um, I've spent some time trying to figure out how working conditions for people in seafood can be seen. And um, the reason I focused on that is um, working conditions are something that the industry provides in the seafood sector and that they can improve. Um, me personally, um, I'm an interdisciplinary scientist, but I spent my 20s working bottom up on fisheries improvements and then my 30s top down in the sustainable seafood space. In my 40s, it's really looking at the supply chain as a mechanism of common property resource management in, um, in oceans, but focusing on the seafood sector. And what I found was that it was much easier said than done to understand what the um, work life looks like for people in fishing and seafood. Um, so uh, I want to just share what I've learned about um, utilizing and tapping into human rights data. So I was asked a question back in 2012 from a colleague who runs the Sustainable Livelihoods Program in Myanmar for the UN. And he asked me, what do I know about uh, Burmese on Thai boats? And I was in, you know, working this top-down kind of sustainable seafood area where Thai seafood dominates in the international sector. And I really couldn't answer that question. But I had an inkling of where to start and who might be able to answer that question. And that led to a couple of years of um, facing a gap in research. There was an enormous gap I discovered, I kind of stumbled into um, between the human rights community and the seafood sector. And that includes our um, uh, environmental interests for sustainability. So a review of um, the data on the human rights side found um, a, just skyscrapers of evidence of a serious forced labor problem in seafood production in the Southeast Asian region. Now there were deep experts in the region um, who had compiled that data. Um, they knew that the use of recruiting agents um, was widespread, but they had absolutely no way to, um, to get at the flows of workers in and out of the seafood space that had not been documented and supply chains for seafood were essentially a black box. Um, so the human rights community that had compiled all that human rights data and evidence had um, uh, also few relationships with the industry, limiting their avenues to change. Um, so, okay, so here I'm coming from the sustainable seafood space at that time. And I looked on our side and found that awareness of forced labor in seafood was uh, low to nil. Um, and so, okay, how do we close that gap? Um, hopefully you'll see a paper from me and others on tools that we have developed to uh, particularly get at working conditions in um, seafood supply chains. And if you don't, hit me up. <laughs> uh, but I will share that we went through several rounds of um, discovery in our developmental process. We ultimately um, were uh, so blessed to work with Humanity United and the Freedom Fund, and um, we were winners of the Partnership for Freedom 
um, prize to rethink supply chains um, around this trafficking issue. Um, but I want to share that we started with an indicators approach and that uh, we were looking for risk of forced labor in seafood supply chains. And um, importantly, the human trafficking experts we worked with cautioned us that it's primary data and not uh, inferential judgment that will help the human beings that are in work in seafood. And um, they, um, so my message is there is a research gap between our spaces that we can close, but we must respect that in, on the, in the human rights sphere, there is a framing um, that is important to recognize and um, especially understanding the human experience of work not just seeing people as victims or, or widgets or um, uh, part of our um, research um, agenda and needs, but to really consider the human face and people's aspirations um, and the realities is important. Otherwise, we can face consequences in analysis um, that include uh, either missing their real situations or inferring their situations and causing lost employment. So ultimately, what I... Uh, like to flag is that there is a way methodologically to embrace the data from a, a different discipline uh, and combine um, through triangulation, you know, different points of view that will ultimately uh, result in accurate analyses of, um, of, the, of the state of work or uh, conditions for human beings and seafood. So in our particular case, because we're looking at human, uh, pardon me, at working conditions in the supply chain, we triangulate input from industry, from uh, competent authorities in the human rights sphere, and directly from worker interviews where those interviews are, are conducted by, um, by competent um, uh, organizations. Again, and we marry those to put together a picture of the realities of work in the fishing industry that are experience-based. So I just wanted to share that. It's, um, it's an exciting space. There's a lot of um, research to be done. It's very interesting to work with people outside of your discipline. And I just want to echo what uh, Yoshi said, that it's not so much a cops and robbers, villain, um, uh, victim uh, story. We have to get past that and think about the dignity of the human being that we're trying to, um, we're trying to um, find that face again on our food. So thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Dr. Bennett. Nathan, you there? Um, let's see, since he's- uh, Hi there, I, no, I'm so. off mute now. Okay. Uh, thanks Jack and uh, Yoshi, Lydia, uh, and also Katrina for, uh, for highlighting the research gap. Um, I wanna just quickly put a, a, a face on, on my story. Um, so the reason that I'm really passionate about these issues is that uh, I have seen the kids and the teenagers on the boats in Southeast Asia, and I've been on those boats with them. Um, I was also in Thailand when there were freezer trucks full of migrant workers that were being opened to find multiple dead bodies. Um, and I've also seen uh, what it means for the catches of small scale fishers and the food security of their families uh, when trawlers come into inshore waters and fish illegally, uh, essentially robbing local people of the, the resources to which they should have a right. So there's much that we still do not know about the dark social underbelly of global fisheries. And I argue that without a complete understanding of the issues, we'll definitely struggle to address them fully. Here I want to quickly highlight how different fields of social science can help us to shine a light in some of the dark corners and illuminate solu solutions that are feasible, that are robust, and that are also effective. First, there's much we still do not understand about how these issues are playing out within supply chains and beyond. Across the supply chain, we still do not have a comprehensive map of where geographically and exactly how different issues are arising. Beyond the few well-known countries and locations where human rights abuses are rife, where else is slavery, child labor, and other abuses of workers' rights occurring? Over recent years, we've heard about surprising abuses in Hawaii and New Zealand fishing fleets. But where are the other hidden hotspots? And what factors allow these abuses to continue in those particular places? Also, while the important issues of slavery and child labor make the headline news, there are countless other injustices, such as the robbing of local fishing rights, livelihoods, and food security from coastal and indigenous communities. 
the previous UN special reporter on the right to food, Olivia de Schutter, suggested that ocean grabbing is becoming a pervasive and increasing global issue. This issue has been well documented in some places in Africa, yet at a global scale, we do not really have a clear picture of exactly where and how global seafood supply chains are contributing to the robbing of fish and food from small scale fishers in coastal communities. At the other end of the supply chain, we also need to understand what will enable companies and consumers to make informed choices based on social considerations. Beyond the supply chain, there are other insights from the social sciences that can provide uh, that the social sciences can provide insights into, such as what is the pathway into slavery or child labor in different places around the world? And what factors drive or enable these human rights abuses to continue to occur in each of those places? Finally, to what extent do different countries account for or protect the tenure, access rights, livelihoods, and food security needs of small-scale fishers, indigenous people, and coastal communities and fisheries? These are just a few examples of the many dark corners where we need to shine some light. The answers to these questions can really help us to identify potential intervention points and solutions to address the problem. For example, social science can uh, guide the development of indicators to monitor the status of different countries global in addressing these issues. Um, insights from the social sciences can also help us to track and communicate risks of these issues to the private sector as highlighted by other speakers on this panel can help us to identify intervention points in human trafficking networks. Um, it might also help us to recognize governance shortcomings and prior ac priority actions to address human rights and social justice considerations in fisheries management in different countries, as highlighted by Jack. This is definitely a complex issue that will require multiple insights and interventions, and we definitely need to be careful that we are not creating solutions as, in the dark, as highlighted by Katrina. The social sciences, including geography, sociology, migration studies, political science, communications, and economics are an integral part of the efforts to solve these issues. But just as all parts of this, uh, this effort, uh, capacity and political will will definitely need to come behind it. That's all for me, Jack. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll pass it over to Sarah, who will moderate uh, what I'm sure are some good questions from the Yes. Yes. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, so thank you. Thank you so much to our, our presenters. And I just wanted to remind everyone how to ask questions. You can uh, type them into the question panel of the, in the user interface. Um, we may also be able to take some questions um, orally if people want to raise their hands. Uh, we could unmute you. So uh, let, we have a couple questions now. Um, one that came in uh, was it is the first time I've heard the word standard associated with the framework. Is this intended to eventually develop into a third party auditable pass fail system? And, and thanks to, they also thanked everyone. Mm, good question. Well, maybe I'll take that first. And, um, you know, standard is a, it means different things to different people. Uh, we're trying to establish what are essentially is a, um, you know, a pathway for either the elimination uh, of these issues or improvement upon them, depending on the, the status or in a given context. So uh, we use standard in, in such a way not to communicate that this should eventually become something like a rating or a certification um, type of uh, scheme. That's not our aspirations at this point. We simply want the, uh, the industry, the global set of nonprofits, both um, from small to large, uh, from place-based to global, um, and the governments of the world for whom this is a responsibility to uh, adequately regulate and, and police and, and protect people uh, to have a common language. And so we don't foresee this becoming uh, you know, a social standard in the same way that something like the MSC or the ASC or Seafood Watch might be. Um, nonetheless, we are in the conversation with the ratings and certification teams to some extent uh, and, and talking uh, about how to translate this into practice in such a way that uh, makes sense for the industry and, and for the sector writ large. And because I know we have probably a hundred questions and not much time, let's kind of go through some more. And then, um, you know, depending on the nature of the question, Sarah, you can kind of bop it to uh, whoever on the panel is best positioned to answer it. Okay. Well, I'll let you guys volunteer. Um, um, well, I'll read another one. Let's see. Um, 
Hi everyone, my name's Juan Virada. I'm freelance fisheries consultant. My question is either for either Lydia or Katrina. Market-driven initiatives have been mentioned as one of the pillars to curb human rights abuses within the seafood industry. In this context, Thai Union Europe signed a partnership agreement with WWF in 2016. In 2017, they published a 21-pager partnership progress report. However, there are little or no specific data about what measures have been taken to stop human rights abuses within uh, TUE's supply chain. Is this approach enough? Should we trust that the companies will take in due time these measures which need and can be implemented right now? Isn't there an obvious risk that companies such as TUE use these kinds of agreements as a smoke curtain to keep business as usual? Mm. Katrina, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, such a rich question. Um, well, it's, it's both. I mean, uh, it's not a smokescreen, but the thing is that the companies will act to um, strengthen their business. And that includes strengthening their social license to operate, which is a positive thing. Um, I think that um, if you're going to partner with WWF, you're going to become beholden to terms and conditions I don't think it's necessarily a free ride with WWF. So um, I actually have been watching Thai Union co closely in the last five years. They were a partner with us initially in our labor safe screen and helped us develop a very extensive supplier survey um, uh, to really kind of ask the kind of questions suppliers could answer to help us learn about working conditions. And, and I've seen them, especially under Darian McBain, um, take some decisive steps forward into a positive uh, role model in this space where few others have um, dared to step on forced labor. Did they have a choice? Absolutely not. Uh, thai Union is, you know, buying seafood um, that has all kinds of associations to forced labor, like everybody else in their region. Um, but do I think it's worthwhile that they try? Absolutely. I think we're in a really interesting moment where the, we, actually, the industry needs support from everybody to get involved. It's been very difficult for companies to step into this space because it started with slavery. And even the ones who spoke to it um, as early leaders, early adopters uh, in the media, their company names became tied to slavery immediately in, on Google, which is no good for them. So it's been a very challenging place um, I think Nestle is still the only company that has actually um, put its name on a report that says there is forced labor in seafood in Southeast Asia, and um, we need all that to change. Um, so I personally see it as a, as a positive, but I think the way to prevent these measures from becoming shallow is for more people to get involved and understand um, what, um, what conditions look like for the, the human being the worker on one end of the chain um, and on the other, what exactly does it mean to build social accountability in these companies um, so that it's more than just a check mark? Um, I think we, there's a long way to go before we have alignment and clear targets. I'd like to just mention that um, I'm working with the Seafood Stewardship Index, which some of you may have heard of. It's uh, funded currently by the Dutch government and it's part of a suite of benchmarks which will be uh, ranking the lead companies in a sector for their performance on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and that's another way um, that companies are being pulled into the social dimension of their production activities and being held to account. Um, so you can look up uh, Seafood Stewardship Index if you're interested or if you're in Boston, I'll be there with Bas Geertz. Um, uh, to promote it. Um, but otherwise, I, I appreciate the question. And I think um, it's exactly why we need more research and more people looking into the details on, um, on human rights and fishing and seafood. Thank you. Thanks, okay, thank Katrina. you, Katrina. Go, did, did anyone else want to speak to this? Okay. Oh, we'll move on. So, sorry, Jack, that I interrupted you all. Uh, Lydia? 
Yeah, just quickly to add to Katrina's um, excellent experience with all this is that um, even though we will have, if, if we come up with um, standards or measures and indicators that it's still really important to remember that we still need the proper um, types of enforcement and monitoring to track the progress uh, or else we could have end up with really nice um, standards, but nothing to back it up. Oh, that's a really, really, really important point. Thanks, Lydia. Can I um, just to jump on a little bit? Uh, this is Yoshioda speaking. Can yeah. you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. I've been working with this Japanese uh, fisheries. It's a very well established community fisheries, you know, just a corner of Japan. And uh, they have uh, oyster uh, industries and a lot of shuckles, you know, people who actually um, take the oyster out of the shells uh, coming as migrants workers from China. And uh, treatments are um, sometimes questioned and um, they're trying to raise the, the um, standard well enough to really make it much more comfortable for the people to be treated, you know, in an equal basis. But this is really ongoing thing. Um, what I really think, as much as you know, the what Jackson you know asked put it out there as a as a kind of like a goal is extremely important. We have to agree to some point, and you know, having the tools which Katrina actually develops is extremely important, and keep on the research. But at the same time, we also have to be aware that you know what um, makes fisheries not to engage with uh, this kind of misconduct, and then that the facilitation, that capacity is something we really have to have a much more understanding and, 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 and potentially need to support um, what can actually make them unable to avoid any of those misconduct. That's such a good point. If I could add, I think if a big company wants to make a big commitment, check into the details to see if there are any frontline organizations involved in the implementation of that commitment. Yep. Right, Yoshi? Yeah, that's yep, yep. the break of it. Yep. Great. Maybe we can move to another question. Okay. We'll switch. Well, it's not really switching gears, but um, uh, what kind of multi multidisciplinary data gaps need to be filled between human rights law and marine science? Mm. Nathan, this, this sounds like a Nathan question to begin with, at least. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I mean, I think Yoshi did a great job of highlighting how, um, you know, climatic change and global environmental change will impact on fisheries. Um, and, you know, when, when you have environmental change coming together uh, with already, you know, degraded fish stocks um, and perhaps, um, you know, countries with, um, uh, you know, challenging governance frameworks, uh, you, you know, you've got the perfect sort of sort of stew of, of, of challenges happening in, in different places. And so I think, you know, trying to understand um, that sort of um, those sorts of converging pressures um, and how they how they come together in different places and and thereby lead to um, human rights issues, both in terms of food security, but also in terms of conflicts or increased slavery. I think those are those are incredibly important questions that need to be asked. Those are, uh, you know, very high level geographical questions. Um, but again, as Katrina pointed out, those are also the types of questions that need to be explored in different places, um, you know, because we we know that um, uh, high value seafood industries such as sea cucumber, um, when those come into new areas, they come in rapidly um, and they can basically push whole communities away from previous uh, cooperative arrangements towards highly competitive um, fisheries uh, that involve, um, you know, violence and outsiders and all sorts of stuff like that. That's the sort of situation that's happening in some places in Mexico, where the, the sea cucumber fishery is rapidly emerging. Um, it's completely changing the nature of some coastal communities. So um, that would be one example of, uh, of a multidisciplinary question that would need to be answered, converging pressures. Mm. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe I'll jump in here. One of the ones that we pointed out in the paper um, was that uh, there there needs to be a better understanding of the complex relationships between the environmental problems in the sector and these social issues. 
And so we probably think that there's some value in doing some hotspot mapping, places where you have uh, environmental performance is, is very poor and places where social performance is also very poor and that those are, um, we know that there's some coupling between those issues. And one of the great things about that is that it would entice uh, uh, more cooperation among organizations and philanthropic groups uh, to work together on these issues. You know, there's some groups that simply have a mission focused more on the environment and other groups that focus more on the people side of things. Clearly, this is a, a, a space where joining forces is going to create more collective impact. And so there's a need to understand geographically those overlap, overlaps, but also kind of the complexities between the, how those performances on the environmental and social side are linked. Uh, we understand some of that in certain areas, and, and some of the people on the panel have done a lot of great research in that area, but there's certainly a lot of scope to do a lot more. Jack, can I, uh, if I can jump on, this mm -hmm. is Yoshi Oto speaking. Um, yep. in, in, in my program, program, NETERS program, we do a lot of very, you know, global scale kind of outlook. And, you know, it gives us very interest, interesting perspective, how we look at the ocean and the world. But often what we are missing from those studies are like really, you know, deep understanding of the mechanism. How did it happen? You know, who's got the power? And when we talk about like power, people think it's such a, you know, abstract thing, but it's just basically who's made a decision, who made a budgetary, you know, who decided who's the stakeholders. And, and then those are extremely important point. And we must not forget um, we tend to do these research in a very uh, a kind of like a short time span. So we only look at like what's currently out there, you know, rather than looking at, you know, how historically it has been developed. And this is the most important part of it. And we must not forget, although it's very difficult, but we shouldn't really collect the mass, but we should really get deep dive into it and really to understand why people are suffering and what they're suffering for. You know, those are not fish. We can talk to them. So I think that's very important. Yeah, yeah. Great point, Yoshi. And um, I see one of the, that's related to one of the questions that's in the feed here and about, you know, data on human rights abuses and, and things. And certainly a lot of us have dealt with that firsthand. And I just want to highlight that um, for, for the ecologists <laughs> and, the, and the natural scientists, on the, the feed and the people participating. participating. One of the key issues here, of course, is that doing research on human subjects, particularly on issues that are as sensitive and as high risk as these are, is fundamentally different uh, than doing uh, research on the status of a fish stock. And so there are some real risks and people who have done this work, either as journalists or as researchers, of Nathan and, and Katrina and others have done, um, it presents a really unique set of challenges. Uh, so developing good data streams and understanding that is something that is going to require increased investment in the, in the safety and protocols such that the researchers are protected, but also the, the human subjects that are being researched are protected or, you know, there's standards of practice for all that, but it is fundamentally different than the environmental side. Okay, Sarah, I think we're close to the end. Do you want to close us out? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank everyone who's able to attend today. And then thank you so much to our panelists, Jack, Lydia, Yoshi, Katrina, and Nathan. We so appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this. We so appreciate that you're doing this work. Um, there's obviously tremendous interest in it, and we look forward to following it over time um, and hope maybe you'll be back sometime in the future, the near future, to keep us apprised of developments with it. But again, thank you so much for taking the time to keep us uh, up to date on this. Thank you, so, Sarah. Thank you everyone. so much. Okay. And uh, thank you to everyone who's able to attend today. Um, there'll be the recording will be posted on the openchannels.org uh, website um, shortly. And if you're interested in getting the link to that, uh, just send a reply email to the um, the email where that sent you your re registration link and I can send you the direct link. To Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Take care, thank folks. You.